I can't breathe. I haven't been able to breathe since I was born. When society decided the melanin in my skin was not something to be uplifted, but a tragedy to be mourned, I'm still struggling to breathe. Because even though my people were the ones to build this country from the ground up, our country is the first one to tear us down and crush us down to dust, and that dust is making it hard for me to breathe. Ever since I can remember, beauty has always been straight hair, thin, white, white, and more white. Six-year-old me looking at Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and Snow White, trying to hold back my tears and trying to breathe with all my might because I thought I had to be corrected, thinking that that was beautiful. I needed to be made right. At six years old, I couldn't breathe. My mother told me a black woman's hair is a jewel. It's wonderful, gorgeous, and can be used as a powerful tool. But when my white friends would skip me on the traditional braiding each other's hair, I would run my hands through my coarse hair and just not care, not care about my Angela Davis Afro or my Queen of Sheba braids down my back. I thought, I wanna straighten my hair, screw being black. Society was tricking me, making me think my hair was weighing me down, telling me stop breathing, don't breathe and then sitting in class listening to slavery and segregation because no one likes to tell us that we were kings and queens before then, my teacher expecting me to know nothing and everything all at the same time. I can't think, I can't be heard, I can't breathe. And not only am I black, I'm too black, too dark to be seen, but dark enough to seem suspicious. Just cause I can't be seen in the light doesn't mean I'm the symbol of evil or I'm the one that got in a fight. The darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. Drink it, and maybe then I can finally take my first breath. Maybe then I can finally move. Finally, I try to catch my breath, make a peep, or even just a sound. But y'all want to act like I just beat you senselessly, threw you in some river to watch you drown when that's exactly what they did to me, did to us. Because when you chain up human beings like animals, ship them like cargo, and strip them down naked, who wouldn't make a fuss? They were forced to decide that death was better than bondage. They couldn't breathe, and neither can I. My ancestors didn't fight so hard and so long so that we can choose not to kneel because our story isn't told in our country's song. Speaking of kneeling, speaking of fighting, speaking of breathing, speaking of dying, I don't want a knee on my neck. I don't want a gun held to my back. I don't want to be hunted down like a deer. I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to be a hashtag. I don't want to be a trend because all trends end. Mr. Floyd, Mrs. Taylor, and Mr. Arbery, your lives will be remembered forever. Though tears will never stop being shed over your deaths, you have brought everyone together. For better or for worse, we're starting to make some noise, a lot of noise. Maybe justice will be served. Maybe all lives will matter. And maybe, just maybe, I can finally start to breathe. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. And I thank you so much. My name is Carol Brooks, and I am part of the leadership team of the Baltimore County Coalition. And I just want to say thank you for sharing the power of your words. And I think all of us witnessed this week that our words and our spoken word will be a powerful piece of our truth and reconciliation efforts in this country. So I thank you for sharing and sharing your vulnerability with us, but also sharing the power of your words. Thank you um, so much. And that's a wonderful way for us to kick off this second annual community forum. Um, good morning, and I welcome all of you. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been a year, but yeah, it's been a year, and it's been quite a year. Um, and so we have a really exciting program on tap for you today, uh, and we're going to jumpstart our work for the coming year at this unprecedented time in our nation's history. We've been brought together as a community for a time such as this. But I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to reflect upon the amazing work that this small but dedicated group of volunteers has done over the course of our first year together and the accomplishments made in the face of the converging crises of a global pandemic, social injustice, and a collapsing democracy. Our first community forum was scheduled in January of last year when we were actually still able to gather in public. And I believe maybe 70, about 70 or 75 people or so um, joined us on that day. Um, we couldn't have done it without the tremendous support of the Baltimore County government and our county executive, John Oshesky Jr. 
and our event host, Goucher College, uh, where representatives from the Peace Studies Program and the Historic Preservation Programs, who were at the time working on the Hallowed Ground Project, uh, as well as the faculty, students, and alumni of the Graduate Studies Program in Cultural Sustainability at Goucher. They still remain dedicated partners in the coalition's work. So the event featured presentations much like what you will hear today and culminated with a group of uh, a group discussion of next steps, how we wanted to take uh, to form a coalition, but first and foremost to honor the memory of Howard Cooper and tell his story. So in January and February, volunteers gathered for several committee meetings to discuss and create strategies for planning a marker installation ceremony we ho hoped in May. And the correlating uh, engagement with Baltimore County Public Schools to engage students in an essay contest and also being engaged in the work. And well, as well as planning uh, for opportunities to raise public awareness of Howard Cooper's story and the coalition's work. So working in tandem uh, with, with each other and with the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, we did receive um, approval of our marker remembrance project. And at that point, we were able to really become a coalition and, and begin the work of truth and reconciliation in Baltimore County. So we started our plans for a marker ceremony Memorial Day weekend. Then came COVID. Um, so our committee group shifted to virtual opportunities and platforms of communication to continue the work at hand. Our last in-person activity, uh, we held a vigil um, on the anniversary of the lynching of Howard Cooper on July 13th. Um, it was a solemn uh, event, um, a small occasion, but very solemn because we thought it was important that we remember and always remember um, the, the story. And this was a, another way to just pay tribute and honor him in absence of being able to do the marker ceremony. It was very solemn and it was very moving, a very moving event. We then moved on to a virtual platform engaging um, audiences in uh, our first Thursday film discussion and our anti-racist book club discussions with the Baltimore County Public Library. Um, the next thing that we did, we also engaged with a member of our coalition who's been a wonderful support to us, historian Lewis Diggs. And Mr. Diggs has been a, a, a treasure to Baltimore County for decades. Um, he has single-handedly uh, researched and uh, written about the history of African Americans in Baltimore County, Maryland, um, throughout the generations. And he and his um, coalition or his, his board members were able to restore a historic church into the Diggs Johnson Museum. We were able to have a story circle with historian Lewis Diggs, and we hope this will be the first of many story circles that we hold with elders of the community, uh, where we were able to pick his brain and hear his story of, of his legacy preservation work, as well as to hear more about his work with oral history interviews with elders of the African American community. Um, we have an example of one interview that he conducted with um, Ms. Levere, um, and she was 100 years old at the time Mr. Diggs conducted an oral history interview um, with her, and he currently had conducted more than 150 oral histories. They are at the moment preserved on cassette tapes and we're working with him on a legacy preservation project to digitize his collection of oral history interviews as well as to create a formal collection with a museum or an institution where they can be archived for further use. And this leads us back to our work in the community of Historic East Towson as well as the communities that are a part of the story um, of Howard Cooper's narrative. And so we're going to use whatever oral history first sources that we have of the stories of the people who were in the community and also re-engage with communities like Historic East Towson and other communities to uh, continue to raise awareness about um, where they are and the story of Howard Cooper's narrative as it went through the Towson area. 
Um, and so with that, I think we've got a, we've gotten a lot done, but we've got a lot on our plate on, <laughs> for the work ahead of us. And so without any further ado, I'd like to um, present our county executive, John Ocheski Jr., who we know better as Johnny O, to give us some welcoming remarks and commentary. Thanks, Carol. I hope everybody is uh, doing well. Uh, good to see all of you this morning. I appreciate the introduction. It is uh, indeed an honor to welcome you to and join you for uh, this second annual Truth and Reconciliation Forum uh, hosted by the Baltimore County Coalition of the, uh, the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. We are so proud to partner with you on this important work, and I want to first recognize Troy Williams, our outstanding Chief Diversity Officer here in Baltimore County, the first person to hold that position for supporting um, your work and working alongside you on these efforts. Uh, we know, uh, look, we know without an honest and open dialogue and conversation about our county's past and our country's past, we'll never be able to truly heal the wounds that exist and to move forward together. So. I commend the Baltimore County Coalition for continuing to pursue um, efforts around community education, around advocacy and research, despite the challenges that COVID-19 have presented. Uh, the work of this group has been really incredible. And uh, since the convening just a year ago, I'm really glad to see that you are continuing this work throughout our county. Uh, I'm also looking forward to the April 17th uh, event where a historic marker will be installed on the grounds of the old Towson Jail. Uh, marking that site where Howard Cooper was lynched in 1885. Thank you for your leadership to establish this important memorial, and I look forward to joining you uh, again for that ceremony. Uh, it is really heartbreaking to know, and we need to tell that story of uh, Mr. Cooper's lynching. And but we, you know, it's important because we have a uh, responsibility to understand our past. Uh, we have to acknowledge the tra traumatic legacy um, that racial terror lynchings have had. And so I'm grateful for this group's work to advance that cause and to help educate our communities um, as county executive, as a former educator, and, and as a resident. Uh, because we know that our county's history has been shaped by segregation, by discriminatory practices, and by systemic racism. There have been policies and practices and attitudes that have developed over decades that have marginalized our communities of color and vulnerable populations. So, through the historical preservation work of our county historians like Lewis Diggs and Linwood Johnson, uh, as well as many local activists and community, community leaders like uh, Mrs. Bentley and East Towson and Courtney Speed from Turner Station, um, our county has truly become more educated to the trials and triumphs of the African-American community. And we owe a debt of gratitude to all of them in Baltimore County for seeking that truth and for sharing it with all of us. Uh, even as we, <clears throat> learn about our past and share that past. We also know that, that there remain deep inequities that still persist today. Um, and so remembering our past is one part of the work, but we also need to continue to look towards the future. And this past summer, as protests and demonstrations swept the nation in the wake of George Floyd's murder, we heard the calls for justice across our county, our state and country loud and clear. They, they were protests that shined a light um, on what we already knew, that we have a long way to go to achieve equal justice for African-American communities. And I know that local leaders have an obligation to be a part of that. So in Baltimore County, I'm proud to say that we have started answering that call. We became the first jurisdiction in this region to take a major step forward. Uh, we partnered with Councilman Julian Jones and members of the County Council to pass the Smart Policing Act. Uh, which in Baltimore County now bans chokeholds. We prevent all officers with prior records and misconduct from serving in our department and being hired. Uh, we required a duty for in, to inter, inter, intervene among officers, and we codified many other reforms that were already underway by my administration, uh, things like de-escalation training and implicit bias training so that they won't be undone by future administrations. You know, and I believe as we are now in this legislative session in Annapolis, this is a great foundation um, to serve as a model for the beginning of statewide reform. And so this session, we are working with our legislators to support statewide legislation modeled after what we've done here in Baltimore County. <clears throat> we also expanded the scope of our equitable policing work group, which is chaired by Troy, um, to make sure that we are having a more robust, open and long overdue conversation that will then turn to more action. Um, and, and 
these are all reforms that followed a year of work before to end housing discrimination in Baltimore County by source of income, which we know disproportionately impacts black residents and other communities of color. It was a fight that many thought weren't possible, but we got it done here. We also know from a report back in 2011 that Baltimore County at the time was the most segregated county in Maryland and one of the most segregated uh, metropolitan areas in the country. Again, a reminder of, of a legacy of racist redlining policies that date back to the 20th century. So we will continue to, to do all that we can to grow and be more inclusive, more diverse and more vibrant in our communities in the years ahead. As county executive, I have made a commitment and am affirming that commitment to you all today to continue working towards a more inclusive and equitable county. Um, working with Troy, we have issued an executive order requiring the county to use equity in our decision making. It is embedded in not just an executive order, but in our strategic plan. And values like equity and inclusion are being ingrained in the culture, and they are also being more codified in our laws. They're even being implemented in our budget review process now, something that never happened before in Baltimore County. But we also know that systemic change and reconciliation takes much more than a shift in government culture. We cannot and we will not reverse systemic racism overnight, but we know that together, through difficult but necessary conversations, we can make meaningful and significant strides towards a much more equitable county. So we know we have a lot of work ahead of us and that path to progress is rarely easy. Uh, we know that we can't overcome 400 years of inequity that started when the first enslaved people landed on our shores with any single piece of legislation or any single action. But together we can, and together we will, continue to bend that arc of the moral universe towards justice. So thank you for being committed to that goal and to doing the work to help us get there. Uh, we in Baltimore County and I personally look forward to continue working with you to shed lights on those inequities, both past and present, and continue working for equal justice for all of our residents. And again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Johnny, for, for, for joining us. Um, I wanted to, um, at the moment, I'm gonna take off my um, Baltimore County hat and put on my um, Maryland Lynching Memorial Project uh, hat and, and give you just a kind of a, a brief idea of how we came into being and what brought us to this day. Um, several years ago, I uh, attended um, a lecture by uh, Brian Stevenson at the Pratt. He was um, uh, on the book tour for Just Mercy. And um, at that time, he mentioned that the first iteration of the EJI's um, Lynching in America uh, report um, had been produced and it just, it kind of blew me away. Um, it, you know, it, at the time they had identified uh, more than 4,000 racial terror lynchings in the country. Um, most of uh, the report, that first report um, concentrated on the uh, 11 Confederate states plus Kentucky. And um, so I thought, well, I'm a filmmaker. I thought someone must be doing this kind of work in Maryland. I'd, I'm really interested in finding out who it is. And um, unfortunately I was, and I'm sure this speaks mostly to my failures as a researcher, but I just, I really couldn't find anyone that was doing that work. And so we started a project with um, a, whole, a local high school and it um, uh, culminated with um, um, the founding of, of, of this organization. So this is the premise that we started with. And by the way, that, that's not a mistake, that 6,500 number, because since uh, this earlier this year, well, no, I guess last year now, um, EJI uh, released a report that they did on reconstruction. And in the, and in the um, process of compiling that, they discovered that um, at least 2,000 more racial terror lynchings uh, that had occurred. So that is the correct number, that there are 65, at least 6,500 um, lynchings that we know of, um, and um, at least 40 in Maryland, which is a mind-blowing number. So we started um, uh, actually about almost exactly three years ago, we did a, uh, a soil collection at the uh, site of Howard Cooper's lynching there, the uh, old Baltimore County Jail. Um, and um, as you know, the uh, and that, that was kind of like our first, that was really the kickoff for the, uh, for this organization. Uh, we incorporated shortly thereafter. So um, what are we, who are we? We're a 501c3 and our, uh, you know, we're, 
our, that our goals are to document the history of racial terror lynching in, in Maryland. We advocate for public acknowledgement and of the crimes, and that comes in the form of these soil collections as well as historic markers. And hopefully uh, in that way, we honor and dignify um, the lives of the victims. And I, I think one thing I wanna mention here too is that it's not just about collecting soil and putting up signs, right? Um, there's a, a, if we're truly gonna honor um, those who were uh, victims of racial terror lynchings, we need to work for social justice. Um, and so that's uh, become a large part of our um, portfolio as well. So who were the victims? Well, <clears throat> This, um, here are the 40 victims uh, that we know of, and I'm gonna leave this up just for a little bit so because I think it's important to acknowledge and recognize these names. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, it's, a, it's something of a, a shifting landscape. At one point we thought we had 40, there were 42 um, victims, but we've, it's changed because we've discovered that uh, at least one didn't happen. Uh, another one was, um, uh, um, a white man, and we, it was discovered by the Prince George's County people. And then another one was actually just discovered recently by um, a, um, a researcher, a historian in Cecil County, and that's this one in 1861. We don't know the last name of the victim, but we know that um, he was a, a slave of one of the local landowners and he was uh, lynched. Um, you could see that they took place over a span of 80 years, but Two thirds of these happened in um, in this 30 year span from the uh, from Reconstruction to um, the end of the 19th century, uh, and of course today we're mostly interested. Well, we are interested in in these two. These are the two Baltimore County lynchings: um, Howard Cooper in 1885, who you'll learn about shortly, and also William Ramsey. Um, and I will say that there's you know a, a dearth of information about that lynching, and hopefully. Um, when we, um, one of our researchers or uh, committees will, will kind of see if we can um, discover more about that. He is listed in a, um, on a pamphlet that, that a, a man by the name of Briscoe Kroger put together. He's an amateur historian. I think he worked for The Sun. And actually I got, a, I've got, a, you know, he, it's in one of these books that he created. And this was uh, earlier in the night, in the 20th century. But beyond that, not much is known. Where did they happen? Well, this is where they happened all over the state. Um, as you can see, Anne Arundel County has uh, more than, had five racial terror lynchings. Um, and all of these uh, counties that are in red are areas, are counties that have um, active coalitions. Um, uh, we're working with all of them except for Howard. Um, and um, it's, um, so, you know, it, it, you can see this is a, a movement at this point. Um, it's become a very, um, popular cause uh, all over the state. Um, most of our work involves helping uh, the local coalitions with um, community remembrance projects. So we know that the soil collected, for instance, um, all the soil that's collected from all these lynching sites goes to the um, museum um, in, um, in Montgomery, uh, the Legacy Museum. And you can see it's a very kind of a powerful display. It's all over there. Um, <clears throat> there are also the historic marker. Um, uh, uh, things, installations. This is the only one actually at the moment that's in uh, from EJI that's in um, in Maryland. Uh, but as Carol mentioned, we have been approved to put one in um, at the low, at the um, Towson site, and hopefully we'll get there soon. Um, and then uh, there's this is the memorial that many of you are, are probably familiar with, and in addition. In addition to these um, columns that are hanging at the memorial, there's a, a duplicate set that surrounds the uh, memorial site. And um, the idea is that they will be repatriated um, back to uh, their home counties um, at, at some point. They have no protocol for that yet, um, but that's probably going to happen soon. Um, one source of confusion I know and uh, we've come across over the year is um, you know, there are so many organizations involved here and I, I just wanted to take a minute to kind of straighten, you know, answer those, those questions. So we have the EJIs, um, uh, you know, the, the first, that, that was formed uh, I guess in the 80s by Brian Stevenson as a, uh, um, represent as many of you know, uh, indigent and uh, other people on death row, people who shouldn't be on death row. Um, and uh, this memorial um, effort grew out of their, their work. 
Uh, we, the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, we were formed in 2018, as I mentioned, shortly after that soil collection. And then uh, in 2019, the Maryland Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established, was created by law. Um, and um, so that they are charged with um, doing a hearings. They're going to be holding hearings all over the state to investigate these murders, which were essentially cold cases. They're unsolved murders. No one has ever been charged um, or uh, held accountable for any of the racial terror lynchings in the state, none. Um, so they're gonna be, uh, that, that commission is charged with doing those investigations and also with coming up with recommendations for appropriate ways of uh, acknowledging and also um, seeking some kind of justice. Um, and um, they, that work is, is ongoing. Um, we uh, also have, as I mentioned earlier, we, have, uh, we are working with different um, coalitions throughout the state. Um, and those coalitions also have independently have relationships with EJI and with the commission. In fact, one of the things that Maryland Lynching Memorial Project has done uh, this past in the last few months is that we've made those connections for for the commission so that they can uh, to, ex to facilitate the, its work. Um, and then of course, each county like Baltimore County has its own um, uh, relationships with uh, local groups. We, we have our ongoing relationships with not only the, the county schools, but the public library and of course the, the, um, the government. Um, and so that's kind of where we are and um, brings us to um, this story of Howard Cooper for those of you um, who are unfamiliar. Remembering the traumatic legacy of lynching in our area. Today, a group dug up soil outside the old Baltimore County Jail in Towson. They put it in a jar to remember Howard Cooper. Cooper was one of more than 4,000 victims of racial terror lynchings in America. No fewer than 40 of these murders occurred in Maryland. Cooper was lynched in 1885, but the seed of his demise may have been planted in 1870 with the passage of the 15th Amendment giving black men the right to vote. There was a major celebration in Baltimore, including a parade and a speech by Frederick Douglass. It represented uh, endless possibilities for the future. The end of slavery as we know it, certainly it was a way of defining freedom uh, for African Americans. It was a way to participate in the political process. The vote represented hope, but that hope faded when faced with the reality of Maryland politics. Democrats controlled state government for decades after the Civil War, and they were hostile to civil rights. Enter the Reverend Harvey Johnson of Union Baptist Church. By 1885, the dynamic young leader recognized that elections may not be the best tool to advance civil rights. He not only read the Bible, he read law. Uh, he read the Maryland Constitution. He read the United States Constitution. He could literally verbatim to give you the Bill of Rights. He, he believed that the full exercise of law was the freedom lever for his people. He has grown frustrated with the state of politics in Maryland. He recognizes that the Democratic Party does not offer any hope. He recognizes that the Republican Party is not going to be an avenue towards change. So he begins to look in other directions. Johnson looked to the courts and in 1885 created one of the nation's first civil rights organizations. So the Brotherhood of Liberty is an organization that was constituted to challenge racial inequality in Maryland through the legal system. Two early wins vindicated that strategy. In February, four black women won damages from a steamer company after being denied first-class passage they had paid for. In March, the state bar was forced to admit black attorneys for the first time. Then in April, in the Baltimore County village of Rockland, a fateful encounter set off a tragic chain of events. At six o'clock, April 4th, 1885, Katie Gray had just gone to uh, the railroad station with her sister. Katie Gray was coming back from the uh, railroad station 
when she met Howard Cooper. And she had uh, apparently known Howard Cooper before. They had words. Katie turned, started walking home. Howard Cooper followed Katie Gray into the woods where something happened. It's impossible to know the truth of what happened that day. Cooper had a history of harassment. Both later testified that Cooper did accost the girl. After about two hours, Katie Gray's dog, Bruno, comes running out barking and presumably chases Howard Cooper away. Katie Gray runs back to her household and her father uh, is incensed. Her father very quickly figures out what happened. She probably mentions Harry, Howard Cooper's name. And within hours, Daniel Gray, Katie Gray's father, puts together friends, I think it's fair to call them a mob, who scour the countryside looking for Howard Cooper. Cooper eludes the mob for five days. The manhunt consumes the county. There is no presumption of innocence. Negro guilty of fiendish assault. The excitement is intense over an outrage committed by a Negro named Howard Cooper. When Cooper is captured, he will be hung up to the nearest tree. This house is built on the foundation of a barn where Cooper hid. A friend told Howard to wait while he went for food. The man soon returned, but not with food. Before long, four people jump Howard Cooper in a barn and bring him to the Towson jail. Word of his capture spread quickly, and soon the jail is surrounded by a mob eager to get their hands on him. With the prisoner's life in danger, the sheriff immediately moves him to the Baltimore City Jail. Even there, Cooper attracts a crowd. Uh, wherever they thought Howard Cooper might be, a mob appeared, um, mostly of friends in the community of Rockland. In Rockland and the county, the demand for retribution intensified in the weeks leading up to the trial. Cooper faced charges of assault and rape. The court of public opinion had already reached a verdict. When you look at the coverage of the newspapers, they present it as if there's no doubt that he had raped her. And why the rape charges is important is because the rape charge is what triggered the potential death penalty. On the day of his trial, Cooper was taken to court early as threats were made on his life. Extra police were called in to handle the crush of people trying to get into the courtroom. Muttered threats are heard on all sides, and it is the belief of many that the Negro will yet suffer death at the hands of Katie Gray's friends. The courtroom is crowded to suffocation. Like a lot of the cases in this period, it's hard to say what evidence there was that he actually committed the crime. He admits that he attacked Gray, um, but throughout the trial, he is steadfast in denying that he ever raped her. She doesn't claim rape in the beginning of the trial. The only person that testifies that um, Cooper had raped her was Gray's doctor, who examined her the next day. The trial lasted barely four hours. The jury of 12 white men didn't bother to leave their seats. It took them less than a minute to find Cooper guilty of both counts. The Sun breathlessly named it the most shocking crime ever perpetrated in Maryland. He returned to court the next day and was sentenced to death. Cooper was held in Baltimore while his lawyers filed an appeal to the state's highest court claiming his 14th Amendment rights had been violated because blacks were excluded from the jury pool. They knew the state appeal had little chance of succeeding, but it bought them time to raise funds to file an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. What Harvey Johnson is hoping to do is to bring this case out of the state courts. He doesn't have much hope that the state courts are going to rule in favor of him, but he does hope that if he can get a case to the Supreme Court, then the Supreme Court will rule on the federal level that what's happening in the state is unconstitutional. So while the Maryland court considered Cooper's state appeal, Johnson got to work raising money for a federal appeal. I think the possibility of this appeal to the Supreme Court absolutely magnified the intensity of those persons who felt like, oh my God, he may get away with this crime. So when the white community in Towson learned that the African-American community was getting close to 
achieving its goal of raising enough money, they were up in arms. I think it quite frankly scared them. They saw in short order that Johnson was successful in these two cases in the, in the previous months before the, the, the Cooper case. And now they see the same person going after the Cooper case as well. And I think they're fearful that he's going to succeed in this case as well. And I think that certainly, um, you know, up the stakes, uh, ratcheted up the tension in this period. On June 23rd, as expected, Cooper's state appeal was denied. The governor signed a death warrant setting the execution for July 31st. Cooper was returned to Towson at the end of June, even as Reverend Johnson was nearing his goal. His efforts were aided by the size of his congregation. Can you imagine having 8% of the Negro population, the colored population, members of your church? So he's talking to them every week. And that was amazing power. And they, and they were intellectual leaders, business leaders. And the moment that Harvey Johnson and his parishioners push that fundraising effort over the limit or over the line, there is a very strong reaction by not only the Baltimore Sun, but also some of the papers throughout the state. On Saturday, July 11th, Cooper was 20 days away from his execution. That morning, the Towson paper reported that his lawyers had already prepared the Supreme Court appeal and were only waiting for the money to file it. We think the patience of the people of Baltimore County is being severely tried in this matter. There may be a great deal of law in all this nonsense, but we fail to see where justice comes in. That same day, they got the money they needed through the instrumentality of Reverend Harvey Johnson. The appeal would be filed on Monday. They were incensed and they thought this brute is going to get away with it. So we have to take matters in our own hands. By this time, they've been just chomping at the bit to get their chance to lynch Howard Cooper. And they did not want to wait any longer. The next day was Sunday, July 12th. Rumors start to filter through, through the town that something is gonna happen soon. In twos and threes, men collect on the outskirts of town. One man pulls a rope out from underneath his jacket, says, this is a cravat for Howard Cooper. As darkness gathers, groups of masked men converge on the jail. The mob waits until Monday morning, actually 12 midnight, Sunday to Monday, because they didn't want to do a lynching on a Sunday. Just after midnight, a group tries to batter the front door using a flagpole. From the family quarters on the second floor, the sheriff's daughter directs them to the back. There, the mob has an easier time of it. They break the door down, find Cooper hiding under a mattress in his cell, and drag him outside with a noose already around his neck. They waste no time tossing the rope over the branch of a nearby sycamore tree. One witness says the whole affair was orderly and expeditious. And about 40 men pull on one end, lifting Howard Cooper off the ground. He dies of asphyxiation. Usually, um, hanging somebody is quick. It breaks somebody's neck. Uh, but in this case, it's a long uh, process of suffocation. The local paper's account begins, the Cooper case has been summarily disposed of without the intervention of the Supreme Court. By three in the morning, the mob had disbanded, leaving Cooper's body hanging in front of the jail in full view. Uh, we know that a train slowed down uh, so that their passengers could look out and see the body. This would have been about 7 o'clock in the morning. His mother came and collected his body around noon that day, put it in a buckboard, and brought it to the church um, on Bologna Road in Ruxton, where he lies today in an unmarked grave. That might have been the end of the story. But renewed interest in these lynchings has prompted renewed scrutiny and new revelations. So uh, I went to the soil collection. After the ceremony, historian Jenny Lyles was determined to learn more about the victim and his family. 
So here's the 1870 census. It is the 9th district, which is Towson Town. I found him in the 1870 census with his mother, his grandparents, and his twin brother. At the time of his lynching, Cooper was said to be anywhere from 19 to 24 years old. The census tells a far different story. So here you can find Henrietta Cooper, it says Celeste, Howard, Henry, and Howard and Henry, it's six out of 12, so six months. He was six months old. Then by 1885, that means he could have only been 15 years old, no more. And that was rather shocking to me, that he, I was no longer looking for a man of 25, that I was looking at a kid. Today, Towson is the Baltimore County seat, a legal center, and a college town. But in 1885, a child was lynched here. What we do with that knowledge, that truth, will determine the kind of community our own children inherit. In order for us, if we're going to, you know, have any meaningful reconciliation, any meaningful progress in, in race relations, we have to understand and know that history. It's too important not to know. ourselves. It's a, such a tragic story and I, I think um, it points out the importance of continuing to research and learn the truth about these things. We didn't, if, you know, if Jenny Lyles hadn't been at that, um, at that ceremony, we wouldn't know uh, how young Howard Cooper was at the time of his lynching and it's important for us to tell the truth as we say, there can be no reconciliation until there is truth. Um, you know, um, Sherilyn Eiffel talks about projects of reconciliation, and I think that's hopefully that's what we are involved in here. Um, and she defines it as uh, when a community, and it's got to be a community level, when a community acknowledges difficult truths and then takes personal responsibility for injustice. So um, I hope that's what, that's what this effort is about. Um, I wanna introduce now um, uh, our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Charles Chavis. Dr. Chavis is the uh, assist he's assistant professor of conflict resolution and history at, um, uh, and the, he's also the founding director of the John Mitchell program, John Mitchell Jr. program for history, justice at, and race at uh, George uh, Mason. Uh, University. He's the vice chair of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and he also is a member of the board of directors of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. Um, and I should also add that he is um, ours, having just finished, uh, literally, um, he, a book that he, uh, will be published or will be available soon, we hope, for pre-order uh, on the lynching of um, Matthew Williams on the Eastern Shore. And the, the name of the book is The Silent Shore, the lynching of Matthew Williams and the politics of racism in the free state. And you can be sure that when it's available for pre-order, it'll be announced in our newsletter. Um, so, um, Charles? Well, thank you so much, Will, for the introduction. I wanna thank all of you who have gathered here. I'm just so inspired by the community and what you all have been able to do around such a sensitive um, and traumatic history, right? But the only way we can deal with it is by facing it and. You know, that's why narrative change is just so essential to the work that I do. And I think we need to give from show thanks to Will, but also to the young poet, future president as well, who spoke earlier, um, because everything that they're doing and what, what I do as well is narrative change, whether we call it that or not, we're, we're changing the narrative using the gifts that we have. Will does it through film, I do it through fit, um, history, and um, Miss Eaton Martinez does it through her poetry and her voice. 
and we're thankful for that. And um, I just really want to briefly um, talk about the importance of narrative change and what this work um, really means overall. You know, as Will um, stated, this is the first step um, as we look to moving towards some type of social transformation or repairing the breach, if you will, as it relates to um, our nation's failure to deal with systemic inequalities. The first step in that is understanding that the narrative that has historically been told is not the complete narrative, right? Um, and this is why um, when we see cases like Howard Cooper and others, um, we notice that there's, there's myths and there's things that are told from a slanted perspective, right? So those in, in power oftentimes control the narrative. I mean, within that, we see, what we see produced is narrative violence, is what I call narrative violence. And, you know, the, the same way that the system of inequalities manifest um, structurally in the nation, they also manifest as it relates to the ways in which we as a nation, as communities, tell our history. And so I'm so thankful to have an educator um, from Tulsa who is, is working through that and developing, has developed this um, toolkit and resources to be able to teach this. Because I think it is very important. It's one thing for me as a scholar historian to talk about in the in, in, in higher education, but what does this look like um, throughout um, the educational process? And also, um, you know, that's just so essential. Um, <clears throat> I really think it's important for us to also understand that a lot of the things that we see today continue to exist because of our failure to confront and understand the historical realities that we um, have yet to deal with. One of the major things for me uh, being so intimately connected to this research and practice, um, I recently rewrote the forward of my book because um, after the January 6th events, um, and someone who studies mob violence, mob psychology, um, it was extremely traumatic for me, as it was for a lot of others, I can imagine. Um, the day before um, the riot on the Capitol, we had a Black and a Jewish man be elected as senators in Georgia. Um, and as I begin to um, embrace my, my six-year-old son and you know think about his future and what this meant, um, the next day, we woke up to see um, rioters descend um, on the Capitol with nooses, um, uh, with Auschwitz shirts and things like that, that you know, we thought as a nation, for some of us, right, our nation has, has moved beyond this. But um, as a historian, I remember that um, in 1925, less than 100 years ago, um, the Klan descended on the Capitol, right? All of these things and all of this history is important for us to understand and our failure to confront it um, gives it license to resurface um, as any structural um, issue that goes untouched and unrecognized. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to leave it there because I do want to leave time for Q&A, but I am so thankful for this opportunity. I'd also like to say very briefly that um, the myth of white supremacy and superiority is allowed to thrive and survive because of the suppression of narratives. Um, so the work that we do around salvaging the narratives of um, the 6,500 6, Howard Coopers, um, Breonna Taylors and George Floyds is, is so important. Um, and we have to continue to center them, their narratives and their lived experiences and the traumas of their communities. If we're gonna have a real conversation about reconciliation in our communities and in our nation. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I wanted to, um... I wanted to ask you um, if you could speak a little bit to, um, you know, we, we, we know that we can draw a straight line between the impunity with which um, Blacks have been lynched historically uh, and the impunity of the police today in shooting Black people in the back. Um, but there are other ways that um, the, um, that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the virus of white supremacy um, uh, is, is felt today. And I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit of that. You know, we talk about that, we know that health disparities, income disparities, um, the way educational resources in Maryland are distributed, the way, um, you know, the differences in, 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 in the rates of arrest. Maryland, um, it stunned me to learn, it has the greatest disparity, a racial disparity in the prison population in the country, in the country. Um, and of course, we just went through uh, an election where the um, uh, uh, 
difficulties um, where the, you know, where the intentional suppression of a black vote was felt. And in fact, we just learned this morning, right, overnight, the New York Times report about um, uh, the efforts to um, overturn the uh, Georgia results. So can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, you know, one of the, um, and I, I will give it to you in a second. I just, you know, one thing that is really useful that, that um, I learned um, that I read actually after the George Floyd thing was something by um, Barbara Smith in, in the Boston Globe. And she talked about um, the distinction between white supremacy and bigotry. And, 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 you know, which is, I think, useful in this sense because white supremacy does not require bigotry, right? It's, she likens it to an operating system. It's there, it's built in. And, and so I think, I think one of the things that people don't quite understand or are beginning to understand better is how that white supremacy is manifest in our everyday lives. Yeah, um, thank you so much for laying that out when we present the question. Yeah, we have to understand the myth of white supremacy because that's what it is, is, you know, um, is really a, a virus in many ways that evolves and adapts um, for its own survival in this country. And, you know, the minute that we talk about racial terror lynchings, um, you know, there's a law that, um, we, we, even when you look at the definition of lynching, right, you have a, it's a mob, right, of two or three or more, right, the legal definition. Um, however, what happens when you, the definition changes, right, that shows how white supremacy evolves and adapts, right, so then we move from um, in many ways, we're trapped in the language and the laws and our systems. And a lot of these things are allowed to perpetuate in new form, whether it's police brutality. You mentioned the prison industrial complex. Um, we talked about COVID-19 is one of those major blaring um, disparity issues that we see with um, African-American and, and uh, indigenous populations in this country, Native American populations. But I mean, it's all throughout. It's throughout the education system. And Maryland, in many ways, has historically been given cover as a result of you know, this border status, if you will. But, you know, the work that's going on in this state is so important because it shows that states like Maryland don't get off the hook um, because we only have 40 cases. Whereas you have other places that have been focused on like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and others who are always talked about historically, but Maryland seems to always find a way to, you know, get it, um, hide behind this idea of progressive, it as a progressive state, not recognizing that again, white supremacy manifests throughout our country. It is an American issue that we have yet to resolve systemically. Um, and until we have that real conversation about um, it as the way it functions within our systems, throughout all of our systems, which I think is extremely telling about the executive order that was, really re that was briefly released, um, that was released by um, President Biden around dealing with systemic racism within all of our institutions. But to the point of lynching, it is important for us to make a distinction between racism and anti-blackness. And what we see in this country in terms of lynching, it is systemic, I name it as for what it is, and it is systemic anti-blackness, which in many ways has provided and laid a blueprint for the ways in which others have been historically oppressed within this country, um, whether it be um, women, um, you know, not poor whites, et cetera. Um, with the exception of the indigenous um, people of, of this of this land. Um, so I would just say that I hope that I answered your question, um, Will. Thank you, yeah. I think we're having a little trouble. Um, Carol, are you are you on? Okay, I think she's on, but she but there's some technical issues. So anyway, thank you, Charles. I, I just want to, um, to, um, to uh, f just finish that thought. Um, you know, there's a, um, we have a, situation and we're going to hopefully we'll talk about it in a little bit um, in Towson and we were talking about ways that white supremacy rears its ugly head. There's a, a proposal to put a, um, an affordable housing unit in um, unit, I should say, it's a massive structure, 56 units. Um, to, and it would, it, it's being proposed to go right in the middle of the historic East Towson neighborhood, which as many of you know is um, an old historic black community. It was founded by um, freed slaves from the um, Ridgely Estate, Hampton Mansion, uh, not too far away. And um, I think it's an example of uh, what Barbara Smith was talking about, where it's uh, not necessarily um, motivated by racism, but an expression of white supremacy 
um, the, the way it's being handled and the decision to put it there. We'll hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Um, I'll just respond quickly to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm so glad you brought that up because I um, mean we see that throughout our country, and I think you know we have um, a Tulsa scholar who's going to speak briefly. But oftentimes we focus on places like Tulsa and look at the systemic anti-black violence that sought to annihilate um, a black community. But we fail to look at the, the slow moving and slow drip evolution of white supremacy that manifests itself through systemic policies of, to your point, displacement, which is what your name is happening in Towson. It is displacement. And it all it's all tied to um, the ways in which we look at historical trauma being manifest um, within this country. I mean, so the strategy of displacement is not new. Um, but um, in places like progressive areas and border states like Maryland, it is a strategy that is used to socially control um, Black communities um, as they seek to rise um, from the trauma and the history and the legacy of injustice in their communities. And so it's no surprise that this is happening even to this day. Um, I know that in the case that I'm focusing on the Eastern Shore, um, it is the same situation post-lynching. You have um, when lynchings became played out in Maryland, if you will, um, and we decided to become more progressive um, to the nation. Um, we had to change our the white supremacy had to evolve and switch it, switch up, if you will, and we did that through displacement, through all of these practices that we had implemented before. Um, and it's there's no, I mean, we talk, we see them now, will like um, to this day, but if we look through history, we'll see that it was strategic. And it was directly targeted to uh, dismantle and to displace um, black communities. 